Ready to get going, sir? All right. Welcome to EMS Challenge. Thank you for smiling or not, right? Great. Sorry, we're a few minutes late. World is busy. Um, Dr. Payne uh, cannot make it today. We'll do our stroke updates uh, probably on the uh, next second Wednesday. We'll do that and talk about IMSA. Uh, but we'll get started today. I'm going to talk about some head and neck emergencies. Uh, uh, for those of you new to EMS Challenge, we started this about six, seven years ago to improve uh, physician led con ed in the region uh, and trying to continue to do so. Uh, of note, for the you know, past five or six years, we talked about EMS fellows coming out into the, into the field. Those are here, Dr. Brown and Dr. Payne. I just lost it, didn't I? That's not a good sign. Great. Um, so you've been seeing them around in the Birmingham region. <coughs> we also will have uh, the uh, second year class of emergency medicine residents at UAB will be doing a, a month of EMS throughout the year. You see these, those guys as well. So get very excited for your certificate. There'll be a, a link in the chat box or you can always email Alabama at emschallenge.com. Uh, try to get that to us today, please, so we can get this stuff out to you guys. Updates. If you have not had your vaccine, please get it. Uh, COVID is real. Uh, no matter what you see on TV, there are some people having bad outcomes with this. Uh, so I still do recommend the vaccines. Uh, that's a great movie to watch before you get it. Just FYI. Remember, National Registry has uh, extended their uh, distributive or non-distributive. Which one is it, Chief? Yeah. Distributive, so that you can get your Con Ed uh, online for the next uh, cycle. Uh, so if you need Con Ed, you can go to our YouTube channel. We give Con Ed for EMS through there. We don't have nursing Con Ed for that now. Do have EMS. Um, we'll be um, you know, we'll be in Troy uh, at the end of the month. We were in Mo Mobile uh, last class. But uh, in Troy, uh, that'll be post it's already posted on the BRIMS webpage, the location, uh, and it's on, be on Facebook this afternoon. Uh, we'll be in Rocky Ridge, somewhere in that area uh, in August. And then for anybody that's in the uh, BRIMS region, uh, we have MDAC meeting at the Gardendale Civic Center at 1 o'clock today. Let's yeah, see. I might want to mention that the, the days are reversed in August for that's that's right. So yeah, so in August we had to change things up because of the GEMS conference. So we're going to do uh, morning lectures on the second Wednesday of August, and that afternoon we're going to have the skills labs, which would be advanced airway, surgical airway, uh, scenario, megacode scenarios, and then pit crew CPR. And that will be in Shelby County area. Uh, uh, and Rocky Ridge is sponsoring us, and so we'll have that location posted pretty soon. And then the fourth Wednesday of August we'll be back here at Center Point. We had to mix it up because of the uh, GEMS conference. Uh, in Austin or San Antonio. All right, so 12 leads. I'm going to do just a quick talk about these things. Remember, um, 12 leads are very important. The only way you get better with these things is review them continuously. So this is the continuous review. I'm going to just kind of go through the way I look at this. Um, I always have a way to look at 12 leads the same way every time. So when you're tired, you don't miss something. And this is the way that I look at them. If you don't like the way I do it, that's fine. You want to offend me but have a way to look at these things so you don't miss things, all right? So I look, is the rate too fast, too slow, or okay-ish? I would say this rate is okay. I use numbers between 50 and 150, and then after that, I start looking at injury patterns. So I could look at leads one, AVL, and lateral. I look at two, three, and AVF. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look B1 through V4 for elevation, which will be a septal or anterior infarct, or depression, which is a posterior infarct, and you do not need a posterior EKG. This is enough data to put them in a STEMI system and move to the appropriate cath lab available hospital. The last thing I do is I look at lead AVR. Leads one and lead AVR should be opposite. If you're up in one, you should be down in AVR. Kind of tells you the leads are on correctly. If they're not there, reassess them, okay? But elevation of lead AVR and depression anywhere else in an injury pattern, whether it be laterally or inferiorly or through here is concerning. But if you're ST depression, T wave inversion here, you already got a posterior, you should be done, right? So after I do that, I go back, I look at my intervals. You got to understand the PR interval, the importance of that. Most importantly, prolonged PR, YQRS is signs of hyperkalemia. First three heart blocks are not concerning clinically. QRS duration, you got to understand that to determine if you have a left or right bundle. And then a QT interval will give you a lot of data. Anybody that syncopizes or passes out needs an EKG looking for dysrhythmia or long QT, because long QT can lead to a lot of problems. And there are medicines that we give in the field every day that prolong the QT, such as Benadryl, Haldol, Zofran, and long QT puts you into torsades, right? 
All right. And after you know the QRS complex, you can kind of start working on your left bundles and your right bundles. And we're not going to go into that today deeply. We'll do more of those on the fourth Wednesday. Sweet. So first case for the day. This is a guy that said he uh, woke up, he went out drinking the night before, had a good night. And next morning he woke up and his lip was swollen. So he's got some swelling here along his upper lip, a little bit on the lower lip. OK, he's got no rash, no itching. Blood pressure is fine. Heart rates are fine. He's at 99 percent, breathing about 14, 16 times a minute. So what kind of things could be going on with this dude? And what do you want? What would you want to look at if you show up old scene and you saw a guy with a swollen lip? We call it a differential diagnosis, but really it's things that could be causing it. What could things could be causing a swollen lip? It could be angioedema, yes. Thank you, Chief. You are so smart. <laughs> yeah. So you think about things in order of high priority, things that hurt people first. So yes, could be angioedema. Other things to think about, maybe he was out drinking and somebody jacked him. So maybe it's soft tissue trauma. Maybe he has poor dentition. Maybe he has an abscess. Okay. But it could also be some angioedema. All right. These are just some more pictures of the sky. So you can see we've got pretty good swelling along the face here. It was really non-tender. When I looked at his teeth, he had poor dentition, had a few broken teeth, but nothing that looked like a big abscess or anything. So question I started asking the guy, um, obviously, any health problems? Do you take any medication such as blood thinners, right, in case he was injured? Uh, any other health problems, hypertension, diabetes, all right? So things that I think about, xenoabscess, facial cellulitis or infection, trauma, allergic reaction, and of course, Chief blew my joke to angioedema from funky cold medina which nobody probably knows that song anymore so angioedema so the, a couple of ways this happens um two most common is a histamine response the other is a bradykinin right and this is i know y'all heard of this from like ace inhibitors the blood pressure medicine or arbs okay the two other ways is hereditary and then sometimes you can get some trauma that causes this but the more common is histamine and bradykinin that's the the more common things you're going to see when you think about um, histamine or mast cell mediated, it's an allergic reaction. So for some reason, the body gets exposed to an allergen, the body responds, it causes vasodilatation, a histamine release, and you get swelling. Usually with the allergic reaction of angioedema, you're going to have more than one body system. So it's not going to be just a lip or just a tongue. They're going to be wheezy. They're going to be having a rash or itching. Um, if it's true anaphylaxis, they're going to have urticaria. They're probably going to have hypotension, be altered, uh, and have pretty significant signs. So isolated facial swelling with no other symptoms is usually not an allergic reaction or histamine response. The bradykinin is not as associated with urticaria, bronchospasm, or other things. So if I had someone who has facial swelling and no other symptoms, I'm pretty concerned about this could be a potentially ACE inhibitor. The problem is a lot of the patients don't know what medicines they're on. So you don't have to be super detailed and say, do you take an ACE inhibitor, right? So if they have a history of hypertension, if they take the blue pill, the white pill, the green pill, and they have facial swelling, you're going to assume this is ACE inhibitor induced because there's a big risk they can have a bad outcome with this. The ACE inhibitors, uh, most of those drugs end in ill. So fosinopril, lisinopril, if you can figure that out or look at the Walmart bag of medicines and see that, that's a big indication for that. Okay. The cool thing or uncool thing with the angioedema caused by beta -kin is that it can happen on day one of the other centipril, the first dose they take it, or they can be on this medicine for 10 years and then all of a sudden develop this as well. There's got to be a genetic component to this. We're not really sure, uh, but definitely a concerning thing. The way this works is somehow the medicine screws up the clotting cascade. You get a buildup of this bradykinin or bradykinin, depending on where you're from, which causes big vasodilatation and smooth muscles. And it's usually just the smooth muscles of the upper airway, the lips, the tongue, the posterior pharyngeal area. Treatment, treatment is always airway for these people, right? So facial swelling, lip swelling, uh, the problem is you're gonna lose an airway and that should not happen with us in the pre-hospital or the ER area, right? So if it's an allergic reaction, mast cell histamine response, racemic epi works pretty good. Um, what does racemic epi do? Anybody know, anybody care? Yeah, vasoconstriction, right? So epinephrine, you, ne you nebulize that in and it makes the upper airway, it constricts the vessels. So therefore you get less blood supply to those tissues so that less fluid can leak out and they get swollen. Y'all come on in. 
make him walk in front of the camera. <laughs> so Racine McEpi is pretty good. Um, there is a commercial product out there you can buy and carry. Racine McEpi and Efren is 2.25%, I think. Or if you want to, you can make your own. Take Epi 1 to 1,000 and you draw up a milligram, all right, or half a milligram and put it with three cc's of saline and nebulize that. It works great. There's limited risk to racemic epi. You're not going to cause somebody to get super tachycardic or hypertensive, and there's a potential benefit for that. So it works pretty good, right? It's also pretty easy to get started by somebody when well, somebody else has finished up the primary exam, working on IV access for more aggressive therapy. In the hospital, we give steroids. Steroids decrease inflammation, decrease, decrease swelling. Um, some agencies are carrying hydrocortisone. Uh, the problem with steroids in the field is the fact that it's going to take four or six hours for these to start kicking in. So you're better off working on airway management. Uh, but all these folks in the hospital will get steroids. H1 and H2 blockers. So H1 blocker is what drug? What drug is that? Antihistamine that we carry in the, in the field. Benadryl, yeah, it's Benadryl, yeah, so Benadryl. The H2 blockers are your Pepsid and your Zantac. We use those IV in the hospital. There's some crossover. So the H2 blockers kind of work on the histamine one and vice versa. So, you know, 50, 25, 50 of Benadryl IV for this person is reasonable, all right? Uh, and then in the hospital, we're gonna give Pepsid or Zantac. Epinephrine, if it's a true histamine response, anaphylaxis, IM epi is the way to go with these people. So if this guy has facial edema, if he has tongue swelling, he's got a rash, he's itchy, you're concerned about airway compromise, he gets IM epi at that point in the game, okay? Works pretty good. So doc, does the IM epi work if it's really just an angioedema? If it's an anaphylactoid? If it's not anaphylactoid, it's not, right. So you, before you're giving somebody IM epi, you wanna have more than one organ system. You want more than just the face, right? So they're gonna be facial swelling, tongue swelling. They should be itchy. They're probably altered, probably have hypotension, right? Because there's a risk to everything, right? So with this person here, if this person was 60 and they're already hypertensive, having trouble breathing, and they have no rash, no wheezing, and they're hypertensive, not hypotensive, if I give them epi, it can make them actually worse, right? So epi, IM, is used for anaphylaxis or severe allergic reactions. Well, on the angioedema, airway is the primary concern. Correct. So how do you treat it? Is it in other words, is it would you go, uh, is there value to superglottic airway or would you just do uh, intubation or what's your thoughts there? We're, we're getting there. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. He always interrupts my great jokes I got coming up too. You notice that? Because yeah, I was gonna say the other drug that you can use uh, is the modal. I mean, y'all know what the modal is? Yeah, that's for you to take, not the patient, right? Because you see that airway and you're gonna start having some issues. Thanks, Chief. You always mess up, Mike. <clears throat> for the bradykinin types, racemic epi may be of some benefit uh, as far as vasoconstriction, but this is not a histamine response, right? Um, steroids probably aren't going to help as well because it is bradykinin vasodilatation is not inflammation. The beta block, the uh, H, excuse me, the H1, H2 blockers probably aren't going to work that much either uh, because it, again, it's not a histamine response. And epinephrine is definitely not going to work. Okay. Now, my practice, if I have someone with angioedema, uh, potentially I'm doing racemic epi. I'm probably still going to give them steroids because there's probably no risk to giving somebody steroids. I'm not going to make them die from steroids. And if I'm wrong and it is an allergic reaction that's isolated and it's not bradykinin, it would help them, right? I usually give them Benadryl or Pepsid. The exception would be is really old people, mature people. If you give them Benadryl, it crosses the blood-brain barrier. They can get altered. They can also get uh, delirious from that. Or if their QT is really long, I give them Benadryl, there's a risk to that. Otherwise, there's really no risk to the Benadryl. But there is a risk to giving this person epinephrine if it's not an allergic reaction. There's some other things out that we can do for angioedema caused by bradykinin. We used to use fresh frozen plasma. So this is restores those clotting factors and messes up that pathway that causes the bradykinin to get increased and cause vasodilatation. There's some case studies that show in about four hours, FFP will reduce the swelling in about half the people, about half the way. Uh, but the problem is if I had someone with a big swollen tongue like that, probably don't have four hours, all right? The other problem is it's tough to get FFP. The risk to that, there's also a shortage of blood products now with the COVID going on. There are some neuro drugs out there that you can use. There's Baronart. This will kind of help reverse some of this. 
Again, it works on about half the people. The problem with this is there's no way this is coming to pre-hospital. It's about 5,000 bucks a shot, and it's tough to even get this in the hospital. I'd have to talk to a pharmacy and get approval to use this on somebody for that. Um, and it only works about half the problem, half the patients. There are some other drugs out there, uh, one that y'all carry, TXA. There's pretty good data or from case studies that TXA can reverse some of this bradykinin induced angioedema. Okay, so TXA works with the clotting pathway. I'm not gonna get really deep in the pathophys with that, um, but a gram of TXA over 10 minutes from somebody with angioedema that's ACE inhibitor induced may make a difference and reverse that. So that's something to think about. Obviously, it's not in our protocols, but TXA is a drug you carry, you can give. So if you don't see him with a guy who's on a blood pressure pill that you think's an ACE, he has upper airway edema. You've started some NEBS for racemic epi for him. You got him upright. You're 20, 30 minutes from the hospital. It's very reasonable. Call med control. Say, hey, doc, I got a guy on an ACE inhibitor. He's got some angioedema. I'm going to give him a gram of TXA. Thanks. And they should hopefully say yes, right? If they say yes, you do TXA. And there's, like I said, there's some case studies out there. This will reverse the, the edema so they don't have to get intubated or have a surgical airway. There's really limited risk to this drug in that process, too. OK. But back to the airway management, airway management is the mainstay. Uh, sometimes even if you're given the racemic epi, you've done your steroids, you've done your uh, Benadryl, uh, <clears throat> you've done your TXA, they still have strider, they're still working hard to breathe, they need an airway. So nasal intubation was one route. I know that's kind of a, a tool that we don't use much anymore. Uh, you can nasally intubate these folks. Uh, especially if the tongue is swollen, maybe you can get behind there. This is an endotrol tool. Some of you automatics may recognize this. It's got a pull cord on it. So what you do is you lubricate this gently and you gently place it in the nose hole. And as they breathe, you slide this forward and pull this with the hopes that you go anterior and get in the airway. If they gag and get missed in the tube, you check placement and you're there, it's a great day. If they gag, start coughing and you don't get capnography change, you're in the wrong hole. You pull it back out, right? So it's right hole, wrong hole. The problem with angioedema from ACE inhibitors is that a lot of times you get a swollen lip, swollen tongue, and you also get a swollen posterior pharyngeal area. So if it's swollen way down deep, a blind nasal intubation is probably not gonna help you. You've got cricothyrotomies you can do, uh, surgical airways of your advanced practice. We're gonna do some of this next uh, class. Uh, we do surgical airway skill labs in Troy. Um, tracheostomies, uh, trachs done emergently are horrible. If you think about anatomy, so this is a thyroid cartilage here, right? Oh, I touched it. The trach runs down, but you got the big vessels, right? Uh, so big risk for major bleeding. Surgical airways that are done emergently that are not crikes are usually a bloody mess, even when performed by experienced surgeons. Uh, so that would be a bad day for everybody. So with this guy, what I usually do with my folks that I see like this is I, as I'm watching them, I want objective data to see if they're swelling, are they getting worse or not. So I have them take out their phone and do selfies. If they don't, I get permission and I take pictures of them. So that way I can watch over the course of five to 10 to 15 minutes see if it's actually changing, all right? So unilateral lip swelling, just the lips. I start watch, I set them up. I think about the differential diagnosis, what could be going on, the causes. If there's signs of a histamine response, I'm going down that pathway, the racemic epi with some Benadryl. Um, if there's not, then I'm getting very concerned. It could be ACE inhibitor induced angioedema, right? This guy, I watched about 15 or 20 minutes. His lips continue to swell. Once he got tongue involvement, at that point in the game, he gets selectively intubated. So it's better to intubate these people early than for them to get that really big swollen tongue and have to do a surgical airway. If you have a video scope, most of these folks, if you get the scope in the mouth hole, you can actually see around there and get them intubated. If this was a DL, there's no way I'd be able to do that. But with the video scope, you can see around the corner. Okay. So this is a 602, been a pretty decent sized guy, and it was a tight fit. This is another guy with some angioedema. His first picture, he said his lip was swollen. He'd been on an ACE for a couple of months. No signs of trauma. He could range it. There was no rash, no itching. He got a little bit of Benadryl because there's no risk. There's probably no benefit, but there's no risk. And if I'm wrong, and it was some kind of contact allergy to make it better, he got steroids. He got some uh, Pepsid or Zantac. I can't remember which. And I'm taking pictures of him. A little while later, he said he had some tongue involvement. Felt like his tongue was getting thick. 
at that point in the game, we sedate him a little bit, we take a look at the video scope, we get him intubated, and he rides it out. And this was before I started using TXA. This is an older gentleman who had four or five episodes of facial swelling in the past. They weren't sure what was causing it. He had been on an ACE inhibitor for a couple of years. Uh, then he showed up with the worst case. And I mean, just look at this. This is super concerning. Big tongue, swelling in the posterior pharyngeal area. He had got Benadryl and steroids. He was already hypertensive. He had no rash, no wheezing. And they also wanted to give him some IM Epi. And my advice to that was what? No, no epi for you, right? Old guy, already hypertensive, not good. The other thing to think about with these people uh, is uh, antiemetics. So if he vomits, what happens to him? It goes right back down, right? Yeah, you get chunks out your nose, but you can't get big chunks out. So it goes right back down, right? Cool. This is him a few minutes later. And you can tell he's got a lot of airway edema here. There's no way you get a blind nasal intubation with him. And imagine doing a surgical airway on this guy. Where's his cricoid thyroid membrane? Under that big freaking mass, right? So that would not be good. Again, use if you get a video scope in their mouth, you can get around that curve and take care of that. Uh, but the goal of managing these people is early airway intervention. If they have a minimal swelling, they don't respond quickly to your medications, you intubate them, and if four hours later they don't have any more swelling, no harm, no foul, you extubate them, you smile, they get to go home, right? Or stay overnight, right? Um, but if you wait too long and the swelling gets really big, there's no way I'm gonna get a surgical airway on this guy. It's gonna have to be somebody with a lot more skill than me to do that. And it's gonna be a bad day for this dude. And we don't want people to die from airway issues, right? We should be a little bit more aggressive. This is Ludwig's angina. This is not a heart thing. This is somebody who has a bad dental infection that uh, gets a cavity, then they get an abscess around the teeth. That abscess gets in the soft tissue under the tongues. It pushes the tongue up and they get cellulitis. So this person is gonna have really bad breath in the dental infection. They're gonna have trismus or they can't open their mouth, all right? So this is again, another airway emergency. This person probably needs to go to OR. They'll be nasally intubated and then they'll have surgery to remove that abscess. There's no way to get a video scope in their mouth because they can't open it. And you're not going to be able to get the blade in there because the tongue is up in the roof of the mouth. So emesis control for this. You sit them up, you control their pain. Uh, this would be a fairly easy blind nasal intubation because there's nothing in the posterior pharynx that's jacked up or swollen. It's all in the tongue, right? Sometimes these get pretty big. You get cellulitis all the way running down the neck, anterior portion. It'd be a pretty nasty surgical airway too. A lot of pus coming out. <clears throat> this is, the tongue is pretty vascular. With the world we live in, everybody on anticoagulants, if they bite their tongue, sometimes you get some pretty significant swelling, right? Which could be an issue. But again, this person would tolerate a nasal intubation pretty well because it's just the tongue versus trying to get a blade in there may be complicated. This is a guy who was anticoagulated uh, on dialysis, had a seizure, bit his tongue, went to scanner, came back, and the nurses are like, he's kind of snores respiration, doesn't look well. And you go look and he's got his tongue hanging out of his mouth, right? So he's already anticoagulated, be kind of concerning to cut his neck to get an airway. But we think it's probably just trauma from where he seized and bit his tongue. So blind nasal ET tube works pretty good for those guys. Some of the hospitals now have uh, fiber optic scopes. So it's a scope you can stick. It's almost like a snake that you use for car work, right? You can put it in the nose, guide it down. There's a video on it. You can see in the cords, you put a tube over it, but old school works pretty good for these guys too. All right, I think I've shown this slide a few times in the past. So you show up on scene to a guy sitting on the curb, uh, says he was stabbed in the neck is what you're called out for. So this is his ear. This is not a groin, that's his ear, that's his beard, right? And that's his neck, and that's a hole in his neck. So he's sitting on the side of the street, sitting there. How do you approach this guy? Not really, but he's sitting there, diaphoretic, cussing at people. What are you gonna do for this dude? Say roll tide? Roll tide, yeah. Yeah, you can't say war eagle, right? No way. It's a tough crowd today. 
So I would argue that as you approach this guy with this wound like this, I'm gonna walk up and say, hey man, give me your hand. Just step up, let's go ahead and start moving toward the ambulance, right? Go to a rescue. Is that wound significant or not, not significant? It's scary as dirt, right? So if he's not bleeding, he's either dead, but he's talking to us, so he's not dead, or he got lucky. And he got lucky by either it did not hit anything significant or it hit something and he's clotted off. Either way, he goes to a trauma center. He needs angio, CT angio. He needs a surgeon to explore and look at that to make sure nothing bad happens, right? So I would say quick assessment, ABCs, get up, move toward the truck. As I'm moving toward the truck, I'm going to think about the rest of my assessment. Appropriate history, are you on blood thinners, what happened, any of the trauma, all right? Would you put a dressing over this wound? Yes or no? Nobody's going to answer. Everybody's grumpy today. It's like a Monday. Yeah, I agree with that. So if you look at some of the PHTLS and some of the courses out there, they'll say you put an occlusive dressing over this to prevent air emboli because you could have a potential airway injury. I would argue that if his neck is not swollen, he doesn't look like a bullfrog, he probably doesn't have a big airway injury, right? And I would say if you start screwing with that wound and it starts bleeding, now you're hosed. So I say if it's not bleeding, don't poke it. Leave it alone. Start moving to the hospital, IV access, be thinking in your brain, what are you gonna do if it starts bleeding, okay? Now, if this thing is bleeding, everything changes. Now it's all hands on deck. So if you got a pulsatile or rapidly bleeding a venous wound here, it's gonna be gloves on, fingers in the hole, try to stop the bleeding, all right? You can do gauze. Somebody could be hanging TXA, two grams, because I bet money he's in hemorrhagic shock from this, all right? You can do some combat gauze on this if you wanted to. If you're an agency that carries TXA in the vial, not the bag, but the vial, you can draw up that 10 mils of that, put it on a four by four and kind of pack that as well because TXA works pretty good topically too. So everything changes. Either way, when you first see this wound, your mind should be thinking, get up, start moving toward a trauma center where there's a surgeon to fix this. I can't fix this. You need a surgeon if that's really bleeding, right? Cool. There's a lot of anatomy in the neck. All of it is important. There's no bad real estate. There's lots of vessels. There's the carotids. There's the jugulars, right? And there's a cervical spine. There's the esophagus. And esophageal injury will kill you in the long term pretty bad, okay? And there's airway tracheal issues, okay? If you will become unresponsive and the guy needs to be intubated and you go to look and you have difficulty seeing the airway, okay? This is when the bougie may fail you. Normally I talk about airway management, a bougie is great. If you only have a partial view, you slide the bougie in and it goes and it stops, you're probably in the right hole in the cords, right? Versus if you put the bougie in and it goes all the way to the hilt, you're in the wrong hole, probably in the esophagus. If you got penetrating neck injury, that rule goes out. You can put that bougie in and go into a false track. It kind of messes things up. So you gotta be pretty careful on your airway management. You know, make sure that you see the cords, Tube goes in, be very gentle in case there's a disruption in that trachea because you don't want to go in the top portion and it be torn and go out the side. Does that make sense? Yes, no? Hey, Doc, we had a question that uh, came in. I just now noticed it. Um, back to uh, the racemic, use, use of racemic epi. Yes, sir. Um, is that in the scope, would that be in the scope of practice of an advanced EMT is the question? Honestly, I don't know the answer. I would say yes. I'm not sure what the state would say. I'm not sure yet. Yeah. yeah. Somebody's got a computer to pull up though. Yeah. So we'll have to get back to that one. I would argue that if you were an advanced EMT and you called and said that someone has angioedema and they have strider and you told them you wanted to give racemic epinebulized, I would bet $3 that they say yes. That's a lot of money at my house, $3. It's a tough crowd. So this significant injury or not significant injury? Significant, not, yes, thank you, good. Thank you, sir, good job, all right. Yeah, so this is concerning, right? So this could be vascular, this could be airway. You could also have a C-spine injury. You also think about this goes low enough here, this could be in the chest cavity, you could have a pneumothorax. Big, dangerous freaking wound, right? If you wanna be cool, you can learn these zones of injury in the neck. So you can call in, say, I got a patient with a large laceration zone two of the neck that's altered, I'm intubating now, give him TXA, right? You just confuse me though, right? So you can know the zones, nice to know, doesn't really matter. Know your anatomy though, recognize that this can be a big vessel 
aortic arch, it could be lungs, okay, in addition to airway, to carotids, to jugular. When you think about vascular injuries of the neck, remember that the uh, vascular vertebral artery runs through the bones of the neck. So if you have a C-spine fracture, there's a big risk that you get a dissection injuries to that. So uh, current standards is anyone that we're getting a CT of the neck for concerns of injury from a major vehicle accident or head trauma, we're going to do an angiogram of the neck as well to make sure there's no injury there. So soft tissue trauma to the neck, very concerning for neck injury. Okay, so these guys get a pre pretty significant workup. Okay, this guy has neck pain. He has full range of motion, can move arms and legs. He's alert and oriented, but has posterior C-spine tenderness. He's got soft tissue trauma to his neck. Does he get a C collar and a backboard? Yes, no, maybe. Nobody's going to comment. Is he paralyzed? He is not paralyzed. He moves everything. Uh, then no. He gets a C collar, but doesn't need a backboard. Do backboards actually immobilize the T or L or C spine? No. The backboard gives you some way to pick the dude up and move the guy is all. Remember, backboards don't immobilize anything. Soft stretcher is fine for these people. The cot is fine for these people. Um, C collars are probably going to go away in the next five to 10 years. That's my opinion. Don't quote me on it. Um, C collars really don't immobilize the C spine either. I would argue if the patient is altered, if they're obtunded, and if you're going down the road and their head is flopping back and forth, yeah, a C collar, a towel roll, something to keep them from moving that unintentionally is reasonable, uh, but otherwise they don't do a lot of good. The other problem with C collars is if this is a vascular injury, and this starts swelling and you put a C collar on, are you going to recognize that? Probably not. So be advised if you have a long transport time and you see injuries like this, if you have that collar on every few minutes, take a look through the hole or hold the collar, or hold the patient's head and take a look, make sure it's not changing. All right. Continue to reassess your patient. Hey, yes, sir. Get into that, Doc. So we had somebody um, ask, what about inclusive dressings for large neck wounds? That's in all the initial EMS educations. Right. Dressing on neck wounds got to be occlusive. It talks about venous injuries sucking nimbli into the veins. I right. haven't quite understood how that could possibly work. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So, like I said, like, if I have on the picture earlier, the guy with the neck wound, if he has no bleeding, I would probably do nothing versus a light 4x4 four four or ABD pad just to cover it up, okay? But I would not manipulate the wound. Um, if you have an occlusive dressing, if you want to put it on there, that's fine. And that's what all the techs recommend. And the rationale, again, is so that you don't get that uh, air emboli. Uh, I think the risk of that is pretty limited. Uh, and I think the risk of screwing around with the wound that's not bleeding is more than the risk of the air emboli. Now, if the wound is bleeding, everything changes. At that point, you know, combat gauze, four by four, the TXA we talked about, potentially direct pressure with your hands if it's pretty significant bleeding, or if you want to put an agglutinative dressing over that at that point, that's reasonable too. Uh, but sometimes with those wounds that aren't bleeding, you're better off not messing with them. So head injuries, we're gonna talk about a couple of these, just a quick review, um, subdurals, epidurals, intracerebrals, there's a diffuse axonal injury, I we'll mentioned some herniation and then maybe some subarachnoids. So, when you think about brain anatomy, remember there's the skull. Under the skull, you have the dura. The dura is pretty thick. It's almost like organic thick saran wrap. Is what I think about. Okay, you got vessels that run from the skull, the skin, through the dura, into the brain itself. All right. And when you think about injuries, you can have bleeding that are epidurals that are above that dura, and those are usually arterial in nature, and a lot of times those are due to fractures from blunt trauma or penetrating trauma. Subdurals are more venous bleeds. They bleed under the dura, and they kind of push the brain in that way. They're not as uniform. And then you can have injuries deep down, contusions. These intracerebral hematomas, these bigger ones way deep, are usually coming from a hemorrhagic stroke where a vessel gets weak and ruptures or from a brain mass that kind of ruptures and bleeds. The epidurals, the subdurals are more consistent with trauma. What patient population is high risk for subdural hematomas? Anybody know? 
drunk dudes, right? So people that are uh, drunk have chronic alcoholism. Their brain shrinks, it gets atrophy. So it puts pressure on these vessels. They kind of stretch through. Let me have a slide, yeah. So the dura, the skull is above that. You got these bridging veins. As your brain shrinks with chronic drug use or alcoholism, it puts pressure on these. So when they fall down or get hit, the brain kind of shakes. It tears those vessels and you get bleeding. What's the other issue with drunk? I can't say drunk, but people with chronic alcoholism. Um, what else happens to their blood? Is it thick or thin? It's thin, right? They have decreased protein. Liver doesn't work, so they have decreased clotting factors, so more risk of bleeding. So alcoholics, elderly people are at high risk for subdurals because they have brain atrophy. The good news with elderly people is they have more risk for subdurals, but because they have brain atrophy, they can more hold more blood in their brain, so less risk of a bad outcome potentially. So, so yeah, good and bad. Um, and then obviously one of the questions we need to ask all our patients that kind of risk stratify them is are you on blood thinners, right? So if they're on Coumadin or Plavix or Xeralto, small injuries can cause a lot of bleeding. <coughs> this is the CAT scan, just sort of subdural. So if you think about a CT, the feet are going that way, the, sorry, the head's going in, the feet are out, they're looking up. This white stuff is blood. You can see it's kind of rough. That's because the bleeding is under that dura and it kind of gets into the folds of the brain. All right. Sometimes you can watch these. Sometimes they have to go to the OR. If they're anticoagulated, they all get their anticoagulation reversed. So we have to stop that. You have to have, be able to clot or this will never stop bleeding. Right. And then sometimes if they're altered, if it's expanding pretty quickly, they go to the OR. Sometimes they can just drill a hole in the skull and evacuate it. Sometimes if it's not a big one, and they have a lot of space. We can just watch it. This is the epidural. This is above that dura, so you can tell there's a nice smooth line, and you can see that the brain is shifted over. Okay, the treatment for this is surgery every time. If they're on blood thinners, we reverse that, and they go to the OR. This person should have been in the OR 20 minutes ago. Okay, so the good news with this is that the brain itself is not damaged, okay, because the bleeding is above the dura, so there's no damage to the brain except from the swelling. So if we can reverse this, get this clot out and stop that swelling in a short amount of time, this person can have a normal life, go back and do whatever they did, right? Subarachnoids, uh, there's two types. There's uh, from aneurysms or from trauma. Aneurysms are usually coming from like the circle of the willis. You get a weakness in this vessel. Then you have the guy that has the worst headache of his life, passes out, seizes, and then wakes up. If you're lucky, he wakes up. Uh, but you get bleeding inside the deep portions of the brain. And the problem with this is the blood fills up the ventricles. So now when you make CSF, that can't get out. The brain starts to swell because it can't clear fluids. And the way they treat that is they go in surgically and they put a drain in the ventricles until this blood clears up. Sometimes from falls or injuries, you see somebody get subarachnoid, you get tearing of the vessels way deep in the brain as well. There's no way to go in and fix that. The problem is we try to fix the outcome of that. So decreased brain swelling. And that's just blood in the brain from there. Diffuse axonal injury. Uh, you're not going to see an epidural or subdural or subarachnoid. This is kind of shearing in, 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 uh, injuries. So basically what happens here is you get a tearing of the nerves uh, from the brain cell to the cord there. Uh, and these folks have a bad outcome. So you have somebody who's a GCS of three, he's altered. You do a quick scan. It doesn't look like they had an anoxic injury. You don't see any bleeding in the brain, but they're just unresponsive as dirt. And you have a just diffuse axonal injury. These are bad. People cannot recover from this because the brain itself is dam uh, damaged. Uh, pretty bad outcomes with those. And this is a diagnosis of exclusion unless you get an MRI. Don't do, a lot of, don't do a lot of those in the ER. So management for all head injuries. Uh, there are three goals. What are the three goals of head injury management? Anybody know? Anybody want to say anything? Yeah, so you want to prevent hypotension, prevent hypoxia, and do not do any hyperventilation. So there's a guy named uh, Spate did the EPIC study uh, out in Arizona, I think, several years ago, and shows that any hyperventilation uh, is bad for these people. If you get their end tidal CO2 less than 32, 
the risk of the brain dying or being having a worse outcome exponentially goes up. We used to hyperventilate people when we thought they had a bad brain injury if they're herniating. And the theory behind that was when you hyperventilate somebody, you blow off seal to bleeding into the brain, which it does. But by decreasing the blood supply to the brain, the part of the brain that's still alive and not injured, like from the epidural, doesn't get blood supply, so the brain is actually hurt from that. So hyperventilation kills people. So if you have someone with a head injury that's altered, even if you're bagging them, throw your capnography on there and see what you get. If you're getting entire CO2s less than 32, slow your breathing down, all right? Eight to 10 times a minute is plenty for these people, all right? These folks also cannot tolerate hypoxia. Hypoxia with brain injuries are bad. So these folks get high flow O2, okay? So if you have to bag this person, if they have trismus and you can't get them intubated, if they have facial trauma, you can't nasally intubate them, they get high flow O2, maybe a nasal cannula in the mouth hole on 15 liters with a mask over it as you ventilate in your capnography. You want to get these guys pretty good oxygen. If they don't have facial injuries, maybe you put a nasal trumpet in and slide your O2 tubing down that nasal trumpet. Give them high flow O2 that way, and then you ventilate them. Hypoxia kills, hypercapnia kills, hypocapnia kills. And then people say, what about herniation? What if I got a guy that was altered GCS of six, then he seizes, now he's got a GCS of three, he's posturing, he's got one blown pupil, I think he's herniating, do I hyperventilate? Well, a lot of textbooks still say yes, okay, it's a last ditch effort. In the ER, if somebody's doing that, we're gonna give them drugs like mannitol, which is a diuretic. We're gonna give them uh, uh, hot salts, a 3% saline to kind of reduce inflammation, may give them steroids. But in reality, if someone is herniating in front of you, the odds of them surviving is almost zero. People that herniate in our trauma bay, guess what happens to them? They usually die, right? Herniation is bad. So if we, if we think about risk to benefit, we're probably better off on all our head injuries, ventilating eight to 10 times a minute, not blowing off that CO2, because if they're herniating, we're not gonna be able to save them unless you're in the OR when it happens. If they're not herniating and we hyperventilate them, we can hurt them. So my advice is we do not hyperventilate any head injuries. There's only one patient population we should ever hyperventilate. And what patient population is that? What type of patients do we hyperventilate? People who are acidotic, maybe somebody in DKA, they're already breathing 30 times a minute, they get tired, they start slowing down, you gotta intubate them. Those guys ventilate 24, 26, 30 times a minute. Anybody else? No. So metabolic acidosis, we hyperventilate, nobody else we do. Has anybody looked at the category B procedure list in the, on the state website lately? I know everybody has, everybody raise your hand. Yes, very good, thank you for participating, good, All right? Um, uh, hyperventilation is a category B procedure in our state. Kind of strange, but the rationality is we don't hyperventilate people, okay? I would argue if they're in DKA, if they're metabolic acidosis, if they're septic, yeah, hyperventilate them. I would argue if they have a head injury, never hyperventilate them. Uh, low blood pressure. So we do a lot of permissive hypotension uh, in our trauma patients, especially penetrating trauma. There's a lot of good data that says if you have a dude that's shot in the belly and his heart rate is 140 and blood pressure is 90, he does not need two liters of fluids. We all know that, right? It washes out the clotting factors and makes things worse. If we increase his blood pressure, he's gonna put more force behind the blood flow and it's gonna make him bleed more, right? However, all those studies that look at permissive hypotension they excluded people with head injuries, all right? So people, the civilians in our state that have car wrecks and have injuries, we can fix pneumothoraxes, we can fix broken pelvises, we can repair your liver for the most part, we can take your spleen out. We cannot fix the brain, okay? And low blood pressure kills the brain. Right? That's what kills people. So permissive hypertension is great, the healthy military person in the penetrating trauma, but in our polytrauma, hypotension is bad for the head injuries. So there's pretty good data coming out by the EPIC study in David Spate that even uh, in trying to increase blood pressure in polytrauma with head injuries is gonna improve neurological outcome and people survive better with that. Um, there's some places looking at using pressors 
and trauma to increase blood pressure if they have a head injury. Do not do that now. Do not give push dose or micro dose epi or dopamine to your trauma patients now. I'm just throwing that out there. Okay, sweet. What do they really need if they're hypotensive from trauma and have a head injury? What, what do they really need? What kind of fluid do they really need? Blood, right? Cool. You need neurons, moron. That's a cool quote in it. <laughs> yeah, this is a tough crowd today, man. So just a graph, some of the stuff that came out in JAMA a couple of years ago that kind of shows uh, adjusted probability of death based upon blood pressures, all right? And this is death by head injuries, all right? Neurological issues, not the other things. So you can see it's exponential. There's probably no magic number of 120, but we know that less than 120 is bad. Um, we're probably going to be looking at some studies that uh, talk about doing uh, low-dose vasos, pressors for head injuries in the field soon, too. EPIC study, if you get a chance, look at it, it's pretty interesting. We're at 8,000 patients with head injuries, talking about blood pressure parameters, talked about uh, hypercapnia or hypocapnia. Um, and then it also looked at the question, um, should paramedics intubate uh, polytrauma or not? Um, and a lot of the data looked at uh, positive capnography to confirm tube placement. When they went back and looked at some of the studies as well, they also realized that everybody that got intubated in this study got a respiratory rate or ventilatory rate of about 24, 30, or even greater. And we know that's bad for people. So we got to go back and look at that again. Remember, post-intubation, if you intubate some of these trauma patients, think about watching your waveform capnography and slowing it down. Um, even in the ER, when I RSI somebody and intubate them, if you look over at the respiratory therapy, how fast are they bagging them? Yeah, and it's like, and it's like, no, slow down, okay? Remember, it takes a few minutes for your SATs to catch up. You know, if you do passive oxygenation, uh, you're probably fine with those folks, but you don't need to hyperventilate these people. It do, people do not do well with that, especially our head injuries. Questions, comments, statements within reason. You're pretty talkative today, so I know, don't ask me too many questions. Every semic epi? Yes, sir. It is listed under... The respiratory distress protocol. Okay. Under paramedic. Under paramedic. Okay. So there's our official answer. So I'd say people would like to have that changed. A way to address that is come to the MDAC meeting and present that on the floor, and then we can take that to SMEC. And that's how we change things. Uh, we have a state medical uh, control uh, meeting November, I think it's second or third. It's the Tuesday of the Orange Beach Conference. Um, if you want things changed, you got to get involved, and we need help. Right? Yes. Thank you. Other questions, comments, inappropriate jokes we could say online. Chief, what you got? got nothing for you. Good. Just typical. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Well, don't forget MDAC at one o'clock today, the uh, Gardendale Civic Center. We're in Troy, the fourth Wednesday of this month. Uh, we'll be at Rocky Ridge the second Wednesday of August doing Skills Lab. Uh, the state EMS conference is the first week of November as well. And that's all I got. All right. Very good. Uh, We're going to take a few minutes break and then we'll be right back with Dr. Eversall. So everybody stretch your legs and we'll be right back. All right. Good deal. Um, who's excited about some labs and imaging? <laughs> <laughs> Woo! This, uh, this was actually, um, kind of a difficult topic because this is, this is like Pandora's box, right? So labs and imaging, when you get into the hospital, it's like there, there are things that I even want to order that when I type the name in, I can't even find because there's so much stuff, you know? Um, and it's nice in the field because you have one lab you can get, right? D stick. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you got one number, you got to interpret, you get one lab. So um, what I did was I just kind of went through the, the protocol book. I said, listen, these are all the treatment protocols we have. And then just went, what's kind of the next step? Like when this person gets to the hospital, like what are the things if you walk in and you say, hey, I've got someone with, you know, altered mental status, or I've got someone with chest pain, like what are the next steps? What are the things that we're going to do? Okay. Um, there's some of these things that we do have like point of care stuff that we could get that could translate to the field. And we'll talk a little bit as we kind of go through how um, some of that could or maybe 
would not be as great to apply in our field in EMS. Um, so for each one of these that, that we kind of talk about, first thing I want to hit is just the who gets it. So the CBC, a complete blood count, right? This is all alphabet soup right now. Um, pretty much everyone, this and the basic metabolic panel, the BMP, are going to be like the two labs that pretty much everybody just generically gets. Like you can basically survey the waiting room and fire these labs off for almost virtually everybody out there. That's not 100% the case every single time, but this is like, this is the basic stuff, okay? Um, so a lot of, a lot of words scramble up here. Um, I, when I can tell you that my workflow in the ER, I don't necessarily need to evaluate every single one of these things. There's a handful of things that I care about on here. And then a lot of that stuff just doesn't matter that much to me. It's stuff that like maybe a hematologist or an internist or someone would, um, would, would look at a little bit more. The first thing I want to look at though is the white blood cells because I can get information about that. So I need to know um, if their white blood cells are up, I'm going to be a little bit more concerned about an infection. If they're like way, way up, I'm going to be concerned about like a cancer, you know. Um, if they're down, like too low, I'm going to think, oh, this person's immunosuppressed for some reason. And so we see that a lot of times our patients that come in on chemotherapy, we're worried that they have an infection, but they're on chemo. And so their white blood cells are really low. So we still have to have that measure of suspicion. Um, the red blood cell is actually not as useful as what we call the H and H, the hemoglobin and the hematocrit. Um, that's the stuff that we look for to tell if you're anemic or not. Um, so we're looking at those numbers and we go, oh man, you know, their hemoglobin is pretty low, like they need a blood transfusion. Um, if it's really high, it usually doesn't mean much for us. It usually just means they're hemoconcentrated and a little bit dehydrated, but can also mean some other things. That disease that they treat with leeches, the po polythema vera. <laughs> um, not a thing for us. We don't have leeches, so it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, the rest of this stuff helps us decide um, if someone is anemic, what kind of anemia they have, because that's a whole nother topic that we could talk about for an hour, just anemia by itself. Um, and we look at the platelets, because obviously we need platelets if we're going to make some clots. Uh, so if the platelets are too low, that's something that I will fix in the ER, give them a platelet transfusion um, and try and correct that. Um, this part down here, this is the differential part of it. Whoa. Um, this is the differential part of it. And it breaks down kind of the white blood cells and, and tells us what cell lines are up. Um, the neutrophils, the number that you see at the top, I would expect that to be up as like an acute thing. Like I just gave you the flu and now you're starting to feel bad. I would expect maybe your neutrophils to be up. Um, your lymphocytes are the cells that produce like the antibodies and things like that. So um, the eosinophils is interesting. It's one that I look at when it's up. Um, it usually indicates like a parasitic infection if someone has like worms or something. Um, don't see it a whole lot, but it's just one of the interesting kind of weird um, associations. So cool. Um, in terms of doing this in the field, there are point of care tests that you can get and you can get these kind of rough numbers in the field. I think that it would be helpful in terms if um, if you had, um, you know, someone that you knew was anemic and knew was unstable and needed a blood transfusion. But I think clinically you can make that decision without, you know, seeing and proving it with the number. I think you can go, this person has a massive GI bleed. We should give them blood. You know what I mean? Um, and that's kind of what I mean when I talk about the utility in the field is I'm not sure that that would, I'm not sure you would withhold blood if you had blood. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? All right. The basic metabolic panel, the BMP. Um, this is kind of a good general overview of some of the important functions in our body. Um, there's certain ways that we write this. Um, this is how it gets taught to us when you go through medical school, PA school, all these things. And this is called the fishbone chart. Um, and it's a simplified way of sort of writing all these numbers down in a way that that makes sense and kind of flows when you're when you're having a conversation about someone else with these numbers. So we kind of talk about them in groups. The first thing is the sodium and the potassium. Um, 
the reason we care about the sodium and the potassium is because the sodium is the main um, cation in our intracellular fluid floating around in our blood. Okay, that's the that's the most positively charged thing kind of running around in our blood. We have other positively charged ions, but this makes up most of it. Um, our pH is important. Um, like Ferg mentioned earlier, when we talked about like respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis and things like that. So when you have an acidosis, you have, um, you know, too many positively charged ions. So this is the major one in the bloodstream floating around. The potassium is the major um, cation in the cell. So if you have a crush injury, right? and you disrupt a bunch of cell membranes, you're going to have this huge rush of potassium. And that's what they talk about in these crush injuries, is that when you release that compartment and you get flooded with potassium, you can see, um, you know, arrhythmias with the heart. Makes sense. Um, so we keep a close eye on that. Um, sodium is one of these things that, you know, you look, you, I look at almost all these things for everybody. The sodium is one where if it's, too high, um, they can have altered mental status and seizures. If it's too low, they can have altered mental status and seizures. I had a lady who was 103 years old that came to see me from the nursing home. They sent her because she had one episode of vomiting. She was A and O times four, probably sharper than I am. And um, she said, you know, I threw up. I feel nauseous. I don't really feel that good. I said, good deal. You're 103, so I'm going to get labs on you and kind of make sure everything's going okay. Her sodium came back 112. She went to an ICU uh, for repletion. This is one of the things that we can't fix too quick. Um, we have to monitor it really closely, um, and it has to be corrected over a long period of time. If we correct it too quickly, you can actually demyelinate some of the nerves in the brain um, and cause real issues. Um, the only time we would ever kind of speed that process along is if their sodium is real low and they start having seizures. Then we would give them hot salts. Um, so, um, potassium is inside the cell. That's one of the ones, uh, that again, if it's too low, we can have problems. If it's too high, we can have problems. We want it in a specific range. Um, when it gets too high, is that y'all? When it gets too high, uh, we start to worry about arrhythmias. Um, this is one of the H's and T's, right? When we're going through cardiac arrest, hyper K. You know how we fix that if we're worried about it? Calcium, yeah, exactly, calcium. Calcium helps to stabilize that cardiac membrane if the potassium is too high. Um, how else can you stabilize it? How else can you fix? If you don't have IV access, what do you get for hyper K? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Don't need to give them a big 20 milligram dose of albuterol, three or four, you're doing them. Works pretty good. Yeah. And you're driving, when you're doing that, you're driving that potassium back into the cells <clears throat> when you're doing that. Um, you know, I think there's probably more utility to knowing this in the field versus, you know, <clears throat> having an exact number for an H and H. Uh, but again, these are point of care tests. Um, the chloride is actually not one that I look at a whole lot unless they have a metabolic acidosis. It doesn't mean a tremendous amount, but it's the primary anion floating around, uh, which is why we measure that. So when we look at the anion gap here, it's basically the positive charges minus the negative charges. You know, we want our pH to be a little bit more on the negative side, a 735 to a 745. Um, but that's how it's calculated. Fortunately, they know I can't do math. So they give it to me here. Um, when I have someone that comes in, um, we suspect like DKA or something, um, that gap is going to be one of the big benchmarks used when we go through the treatment protocol for that. Um, the bicar by itself right here is kind of a surrogate marker for the pH. Um, again, it's something that, you know, we'll track and that goes into the calculation when we're trying to figure out if they have a metabolic or a respiratory um, acidosis or alkalosis. Um, glucose, y'all know what to do with. The, um, the BUN and the creatinine, that's the blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine. Um, 
this tells us about kidney function right here and how our body is getting rid of waste product. Um, the BUN, does anyone know where that comes from? The blood urea nitrogen, like why we even have that? It's, it's essentially from muscle. It's just breakdown. It's tissue breakdown, muscle breakdown. It gets broken down into ammonia. It gets processed by the liver and packaged into BUN. And then it goes through the kidney. Some of it gets reuptake, reup, reuptake, reuptake, maybe. Reabsorbed. There it is. Sorry. <laughs> Some of it gets reabsorbed, some of it gets excreted. Um, we like to keep that in a specific range as well. Um, the creatinine tells us how our kidneys are working. Um, people on dialysis will come in. So for example, this is a, a 0 0.9 down here. That's great. That means that I can give this person contrast dye without freaking out. Um, I know that their kidneys are functioning like a normal person's kidney should function. Someone who comes in on dialysis whose kidneys don't work at all their creatinine might be an eight or a nine, and it doesn't matter because they're on dialysis. You know, they've got a machine doing the job of their kidneys. Um, but if someone comes in and they're not on dialysis, and this was the last lab I have on them three months ago when they were in the hospital, and now they're here and their creatinine is four, now I'm pretty worried that they've got something going on, you know? Um, so we look at these numbers individually, but we can also look at this stuff as a ratio. Um, Hang on. Um, and it actually helps us decide what the problem is. So if that BUN to creatinine ratio is greater than 20, I start to think about heart failure or dehydration. If they don't have heart failure, I can tank them up and maybe fix that. They're pretty dehydrated. Um, that 20 to 10 to 1 ratio right there is kind of normal, kind of where we want it. Um, but if they are having issues, um, if both of those numbers are elevated too high, but the ratio is the same, then I start worried that they may have an obstructing stone. You know, they may have passed a kidney stone. Um, they may have like a bladder cancer that obstructs the outlet or something like that. So I start to think about those things. <clears throat> Less than 10 to one is actually a disease within the kidney itself. So the kidney is just um, spitting out all of the BUN. It's not absorbing any of it at all. Um, I put this other slide up here. Um, to talk about why the sodium and the potassium were so important, there are very few things that every cell in our body has in common, okay? Um, this is a thing that every single thing, every cell in our body has this transporter on it, okay? Um, like I said, there are more sodium molecules outside the cell and there's more potassium molecules inside the cell. For our cells to function and for them to maintain um, the correct osmotic state, they have to be able to move potassium in to a higher, across this high gradient and out across the high gradient. So in other words, if you were just to open a hole in the cell, you would get equilibrium. So you would have as much sodium concentration outside the cell as inside the cell at that point and vice versa with the potassium. <clears throat> um, if something happens, it's right here. This is this is death. OK, the cell can't maintain anymore. Um, and it's all based on the sodium and the potassium. So every cell that we have uses this transporter to regulate basically the structural stability and the function of the cell, no matter what cell it is. So that's pretty important. All right, troponin. Who gets a troponin? Yeah, someone's like, hey man, I'm having chest pain. Cool, let's get a troponin. We're getting an EKG, we're gonna get a troponin. Um, troponin is actually part of a protein. This is just one, um, one myocyte of a cardiac muscle. Um, troponin is just a component, a protein component of that. Um, and it's something that we can detect and measure in the blood, and now we have these high sensitivity tests and we can detect it at a pretty low concentration. Um, but what happens is, is you have um, death of this muscle fiber, and of course it falls apart, it has no way to stay intact anymore, and so that troponin leaks out into the bloodstream. So we do a test um, and we look for it. And so on the one hand, 
it seems like it would be nice if you're in the field and you're like, man, I got this guy with chest pain. I can get an EKG. I can get a troponin. Like we can start to do these things. Um, even the high sensitivity troponins that we have, you'll still have a normal troponin essentially two and a half hours after they first say, man, my chest pain just started. Um, and so I had two patients, I had two code STEMIs uh, in the last week. One was a guy got brought in by EMS and he looked like he was having a heart attack. I mean, he walked in the door and I was like, mm, that guy looks terrible. He was diaphoretic and clammy. He was out doing yard work and said, I've got this crushing, you know, chest pain, uh, you know, radiates up to my neck. Oh, I don't feel good. And he had some scary EKG changes. So we called cardiology and they said, yeah, this is scary. We're going to take him up to the cath lab. And he had 100% right RCA occlusion. They put a stent in him. He did great. I reviewed his labs later. You know, we sent off labs and they didn't come back until after he was already in the cath lab. His troponin was undetectably low. It was just too early for it for the test to pick up. Um, I had, the second patient I had that had the STEMI came in that said, I have chest pain for a year, a whole year. And so, yeah, OK, good deal. And it was a sign out. It was a shift change. So um, the person that was um, the person that was initially seeing her said, yeah, she's had chest pain for a year. You know, we got this EKG. Um, you know, it doesn't look normal. Uh, but it's been going on for a year. We said, okay, the labs weren't back for you. And so right after we signed out, the nurse called me and said, hey, Jason, you know, she's she's got worsening chest pain back here. Come take a look at her. And I said, good deal. Go ahead and get another EKG. And so they got the second EKG and there were dynamic changes. And she was up in AVR and she had, you know, inferior um, T-wave inversions, and I was like, man, this is different. This is scarier. At the same time, I'm looking at the EKG. The lab called me and said, hey, I just want to let you know we didn't forget to do this patient's troponin. All the other labs are back. It's so high that we have to dilute it, and it's going to take a little bit. And I was like, good deal. So she went up to the cath lab as well. Um, she had bad, bad three-vessel disease. They couldn't put stents in, so they put her on a balloon pump, and she's awaiting a bypass. Um, but her troponin, once they diluted it, was like 33,000. Um, if people come in and their initial troponin is over you know, 20 or 22, we usually trend it to see if it, how fast it goes up. Um, if you go out and run a 10K pretty hard, your troponin is probably going to be up. You've probably done a little bit of damage. You'll recover from that, but it'll be up. In two hours, I would not expect it to continue to rise like that. You know what I mean? So this is one of these things where it would be cool in the field. You could do a point of care, but it won't change if someone calls you and says, hey, I'm having chest pain and it just started right now. The troponin doesn't necessarily mean anything. Make sense? Hey, Doc, just to be clear, we got some folks Go from asking questions. So tro troponin levels are selective to heart damage only. Is that true? Um, there are there are different troponins that are on other muscle fibers. The assays that we have detect cardiac troponins specifically. So when you're doing the troponin level test in the hospital, mm -hmm. those levels, elevated levels, are indicating damage to the heart muscle and right. not damage to other muscles. Correct. Right. Yes. So in the past, right. before troponin got used a lot, we did a CK, a CKMB, and a troponin. Mm -hmm. A little bit fun, a little bit sensitive. And you could get some bleed over with that. Yeah. The new troponins is strictly hard. Right. So the other troponins, like I said, but the one that we test, we call troponin, is strictly hard. We can detect the CK, the CKMB a little bit. We can detect that rise ahead of when we can detect the troponin rise, but it's not specific to the heart. If that makes sense. Cool. D-dimer. Anyone know who gets a D-dimer? CHF. So this is this is something we'll get if we're worried that someone has a pulmonary embolism. Um, I could talk for an entire hour just about pulmonary embolisms and when to decide to get a D-dimer, okay? Um, this is a test that I'm going to get if I think someone has maybe like a low risk for a PE, like it's possible, but they're low risk and they're well appearing. Um, a D-dimer is basically 
uh, little proteins that float off of a clot in your body that we can detect in the blood. Um, it's not specific. We get it for pulmonary embolism. So we get it if we're concerned that there's a clot in your lungs. Um, but if you have a clot in your leg, or if you have a clot in your arm, or if you have a clot anywhere else, D-dimer doesn't care. D-dimer is going to show up. Doesn't care where the clot is. So it's kind of the best marker that we have. It's a very poor marker because, again, it doesn't mean that you have a pulmonary embolism. But if I have a suspicion that you have a PE, your D-dimer is probably going to be elevated. And then once it comes back positive, I'm then obligated to do a CT angiogram. Okay, so then I have to go the next step and look a little bit further. Um, so your patients that come in, these people that you get that have acute onset dyspnea, shortness of breath, they look bad, they're tachycardic. Um, you know, we can look at risk factors, we can use the well score, we can use the PERC rule, we can see if they have hemoptysis, unilateral leg swelling, or if they're on hormones, or if they have cancer, or if they have surgery, and there's all these risk factors. Um, and you say, oh, this guy might have a pulmonary embolism, that might be why they are the way they are. And when they come in and we have that suspicion, this is kind of the path that we go down. Um, there's two different assays we, we have. Um, there's a high sensitivity one and there's a um, kind of an older assay. Um, the one we use has a cutoff of 240, 250. Um, as you get older, you get a little more leeway in this test. And so the, uh, I guess the old teaching was, it was like the age times 10 for the old assay. So like if you're 60 years old, like you have an age adjusted D-dimer of 600 if that makes sense. Um, with our high sensitivity test, it would be like 300 um, before I get a CT angio of your chest. So. All right, hepatic function panel. Um, people who get this are people who have belly pain. So <clears throat> that 103 year old that came in and said I had an episode of vomiting and now I'm just a little bit nauseous. So I fired one of these off on her as well, because I want to make sure that she's not having, um, you know, an acute hepatitis or a pancreatitis. Um, of all the organs in our belly, we can look a little bit at what the liver is doing. We can look a little bit at what the gallbladder is doing. We can look a little bit at what the pancreas is doing. We don't really have great tests in the emergency room to say, Oh, uh, this is a lab test for like diverticulitis, for something like inside the actual like large intestine or small intestine. There aren't really great biomarkers that we can use in the ED for that. Um, and of course, we already talked about the kidneys in that BUN, so we can evaluate their function. Um, we'll kind of go through this from top to bottom. Um, so looking at the albumin, this is just the main protein in the blood. Um, your liver makes it. It helps to bind um, other waste products, other things that your cells get rid of, that put out, and it helps bind that stuff and bring it to where it's supposed to go. So, for example, when we talk about bilirubin here in a second, indirect bilirubin is not water soluble, but it can bind to this albumin, and the albumin can take it to where it needs to be. So it's almost like a carrier vehicle. Um, because it's dissolved in the blood, it also gives the blood some osmotic pressure. So if your liver is not working and you're not making this protein, um, your osmotic pressure inside the bloodstream goes down and you're more likely to leak fluid out in third space. And so that's why you see these people who have liver failure that kind of swell up all over the place. It's because they have that low oncotic pressure inside their bloodstream. Make sense? Cool. Um, Billy Rubin. Bilirubin is how we get rid of red blood cells. Um, when we order this test, if their total bili is within a normal limit, it won't break it down. If this is abnormal, it'll break it down into the direct and indirect. And that's conjugated and inconjugated. And I got a nice picture here. I want y'all to appreciate how long it took me to make the little blobs of hemolysis here. It took way longer than it should have. Um, but this is kind of the life cycle of bilirubin here. So you've got red blood cells, they get old and they die and they break down and um, you have inconjugated um, indirect bilirubin. 
it floats around in the bloodstream, it gets attached to the albumin, and then that's going to get taken to the liver. The liver's job is then to take that unconjugated stuff and conjugate it to make it water soluble so that it can be excreted, okay? So your liver packages it up and then it spits it out into the intestines and the intestines turn it into poo emoji. Um, if we have problems with this, and this is another thing that we could lecture on for hours. <laughs> you get hours of lecture on this in medical school. So if you have a problem with your liver and your liver can't package the unconjugated bilirubin, it's just going to deposit in the skin. Okay, it can't go anywhere else really. So do we know what we see? Like what's our presentation? What's our patient look like? Yeah. Um, so they're yellow, they look like the Simpsons. Um, you can get into a whole other can of worms when you talk about, is it a mixed picture? Is it a problem with the actual conjugation and you have elevations in both? Um, or you can have elevations in just the conjugated portion of it. So your liver packages it up, it actually spits it, it's got to go to the gallbladder to get into the intestine. Well, if you have a gallstone that obstructs, that fluid can't go anywhere. It's going to leach out and you're just going to have high, you know, high um, levels of that conjugated bilirubin floating around in your blood. Um, make sense? All right. Head nods. Good deal. Um, Alkfoss. So, all of these things that we're about, the ALKFOS, the ALT, and the AST are all things that come on the hepatic function panel. Um, and they're all, they're all really poor markers of what we're trying to look for. Um, if they're all elevated, I'll say, great, something's wrong with this person's liver. Um, if they're like kind of elevated a little bit, it's, it's like, yeah, you know, what do I do with this? Um, ALKFOS is one of these things that's secreted by the liver but it's also secreted by bones and it's also secreted by the biliary tract and it's also secreted by the kidneys and like it's just a very non-specific thing okay um when we look at it in this context the thing i'm thinking about most is the uh the biliary tract um so the cells that line the inside of the biliary tract that carries that that gall fluid um it secretes this ALKFOS. And so if there's a problem there, if there's inflammation within the gallbladder, this ALKFOS will be elevated. Again, it's not specific. It doesn't mean that there's a problem with the gallbladder. It just means that there's a problem somewhere and it might be the gallbladder, okay? So this is something I'll look at. I note that if it's high, um, if it's extremely high, I'll have to decide what I'm gonna do. Um, it's easy for me to get an ultrasound of the gallbladder and kind of look at that a little bit more. Um, and you have to package this clinically as well. So does the patient have belly pain right here? Um, the ALT and the AST, um, again, we get it and what we use it for is to try and decide how the liver is doing, okay? And it's, a, again, a poor marker of that because these can be elevated for multiple reasons. Um, it really, it measures like the actual integrity of the liver cells, okay? So if you have someone with like a cirrhosis um, where they have inflammation of the cells and you've got some cell death going on and some scarring, these numbers are gonna be up. Um, flip side of that, if it's Friday night and you go out with the fellas and you drink too much, you come in and I draw your labs, these numbers are also gonna be up, you know? So we have to take all these things kind of into account, into consideration. And this is another one that we can get um, a ratio one, if you've been drinking, AST will typically be a little bit higher than the ALT, but the ALT is a little bit more specific to the liver, okay? Um, lipase, what are we testing? What organ? Anyone know what organ makes lipase? Pancreas, yes. Um, so you come in, oh, I've got belly pain, right? I'm going to get a lipase. Um, I'm looking to see if you have pancreatitis. Um, if it's more than like three times the upper limit of normal, then I'm going to go, this is probably pancreatitis. Um, it's a pretty good marker of pancreatic stuff. Um, you've also got 
your parotid glands that make lipase, but typically not at high enough levels that matter on this test. All right, blood gas. This stuff, um, this is another point of care test that we can get done pretty quick. We do these real quick in the trauma bay. Um, it gives us, so I talked about the bicarb being kind of a surrogate marker for the pH. This gives us the actual pH. Um, we can get an arterial blood gas, so we can get a venous blood gas. Um, the pH is going to be a little bit different between those two, but not so different that we can't make reasonable decisions based off of either one, okay? Um, what we can't make reasonable decisions off of is the oxygen, right? So you've got arterial blood. Um, it's going to go from the right side of the heart, it's going to go into the lungs, it's going to get oxygenated through the left side of the heart into the arteries out to all the tissues. So that blood is going to have a high amount of oxygen in it. Once it goes through the tissue beds, right, then you're going to have low oxygen, high CO2. So if we get that venous gas, the oxygen is going to be much lower and the CO2 is going to be a little bit higher. Um, and so there's a lot of times when we um, especially in the trauma bay, we'll blind stick someone trying to hit an artery, you know, and we'll go, oh man, this blood looks really dark. Mm, this is probably venous. And then you get the blood gas back and you're like, their PaO2 is, you know, 20 or something. And you go, this is hopefully not arterial, right? That would be bad. Um, this is something that they started, <clears throat> the PDF ratio is something that they started to put on there actually during the COVID pandemic, it was something we used to have to calculate on our own. Um, it is the P is the PA, the oxygen in the arterial side, divided by the FiO2, so the amount of supplemental oxygen that they're on. So if someone's on 100% and their PaO2 is 100, um, then it, you could calculate the P to F ratio. We want this to be really 60 is the point when we say this is like the worst um, ARDS that you can have. Um, we were using it in the COVID wards pretty early on to decide when to flip people onto their belly and prone them. Um, and we we're also using it to decide how to change the ventilator settings. Um, and so we were using it so much, our lab actually started to just include it in the values that we get. You get a bicarb again here, same bicarb that you got back on that, that fishbone chart. Um, and then the FiO2 is the number that that you have to tell them, hey, I've got this person on 40%, you know. Um, so, um, cool. Uh, this is super science here right here because there's a graph associated with it. All right. This is a thromboelastogram. Um, if if y'all, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So this is a thromboelastogram. Um, if you bring us a trauma patient and we're worried that they're bleeding, um, this actually tells us what blood product we need to replace to fix this person. Um, so without getting too sciencey with this, um, I can tell if there's a problem that needs to be fixed by plasma or cryo or platelets. So you'll get a picture and you'll get a bunch of numbers and angles and things, but if this right here is too close together, I know this person needs platelets. And so we can just throw platelets at them um, instead of kind of guessing. Um, it's, a, it's a good way for us to replace, this just has factors, this has um, fibrinogen, um, all the different things that your body needs to make a clot to stop bleeding. Um, we can get it back reasonably fast, um, but it's a, uh, I think it's a pretty cool sciencey thing. This is something that would be super cool in the field if you had access to all the different, if you had a selection of these things, you know what I mean? In an ideal world. Um, and then you could kind of guide your resuscitation based on what the patient needs, uh, which is pretty cool. So anyone have questions about this before we, Move on. There's a lot. Yeah, is there an app for that that just shows you what you should do? Based I, have, on the results? I, have, I actually have this picture saved on my phone uh, because in the heat of the moment, when someone hands me the piece of paper and it tells me the alpha angle is some degree, I go, I don't know what that is. And I have to look at my picture and cheat 
to figure out and go, oh, yeah, this Pearson needs, you know, cryoprecipitate. So. Look at the bottom right corner. What is that? So that's my text in. Um, we did a study years ago in EMS in this region, studying serum lactate, trying to determine if we could use that as an indicator for shock as an indicator to differentially transport to a trauma center. Mm -hmm. So haven't seen serum lactate come up unless we missed it. Is that useful? Yeah, yeah. So, so lactic acid is definitely a thing that we get um, in a lot of people. It's something that I feel obligated to get if I think that the person is septic, and it's something that we definitely get in the trauma bay. Um, for a while, we were also getting D-dimers on everyone in the trauma bay, which was a disaster because, as you can imagine, they were all elevated, and then we had to explain why we didn't CT angio the people with elevated D-dimers. We had to go, this is for a research study. <laughs> like, I don't think this person has a PE. You know, we had to explicitly put that in each of our notes. Um, the lactic acid helps us, um, in terms of sepsis, it helps us to distinguish if this person is severe sepsis or septic shock, okay? Um, and they're just numbers that say kind of how sick the person is. It helps us to stratify that person. Um, there are multiple reasons that someone can have um, an elevated lactic. What it really boils down to is inadequate tissue perfusion because that's the byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. Um, and so, you know, if you go out again with the fellas and you're drinking all weekend and I get the studies on you, there's a good chance you might come back with an elevated lactic acidosis. Um, in that particular case, it's not necessarily because you have inadequate tissue perfusion because you're septic or because you have heart failure. It's because you have a deficiency um, in some of the thiamine that actually helps, like it's a cofactor in the anaerobic, anaerobic pathway. And so you produce more lactic acid because you've burned through all this enzyme. Um, so we can give you thiamine and some fluids and correct that pretty quickly. Whereas if you're septic, we actually have to increase your perfusion um, to get that to go down. So we have to take that into clinical context as well. Um, I don't know of any, I don't know of any lactic threshold that would, that would make me, like if you called me on the phone, on the red phone and said, hey, this guy's lactic's four, I wouldn't go, he needs to go to the trauma center. You know what I mean? Um, so, so just like every other test has to be put into context. Correct. Before it's useful. Exactly. And, and almost everyone who comes into the trauma bay has an elevated lactic. But if we had, a, had clinical evidence, say, for example, that the patient was septic mm -hmm. and they had a super high lactate, that could drive fluid administration, for example. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So that person would need fluid resuscitation. And if I had a suspicion they were septic, the real treatment is antibiotics for that person. And so that would be useful information to come in and go, this person, you know, has urinary tract symptoms. They have, you know, gross cloudy looking urine and they're altered and they've got a fever and they're tachycardic so there are lactic there are point of care meters that measure mm -hmm. venous ph and yes. that measure serum lactate yep. from venous blood mm -hmm. and they're really not very expensive mm -hmm. so i get asked all the time well, why don't we have it so for example we use sodium bicarbonate and cardiac arrest without knowing the patient's ph we're mm -hmm. making an assumption they're acidotic which i think is a pretty good assumption but AJ says it's class three intervention. We don't know if it helps or doesn't help. Well, if we knew the pH, we might know if it helps or doesn't help. So I've always heard that the obstacle to that is the uh, lab workers union, but I, I can't verify that. Oh, really? really? I've heard that. Okay. So, so for the state, I'm about, yeah, for the state, if I'm not mistaken, last time I looked it up, if you're going to do point of care testing, you have to get a license in the lab. So you, there's there's more regulation to do that. And I would argue that point of care lactates probably don't make a big difference pre-hospital because if I went out and had three beers, my lactates would go up, right? So a, one lactic doesn't give you the answer. If the patient looks sick, it's dirt, and the lactic is normal, and I still think they're septic, they're still going to get fluids and antibiotics. Mm -hmm. Trending lactates is useful. So if I had a lactate of four on the patient initially, and I do fluids and antibiotics, and I check the lactate again two hours later, and now it's six, Mm -hmm. Something's not right. They're not clear that lactate, but one lactate is you're going to have a. Most of the patients we see pre hospital will have an elevated lactate from dehydration, from stress, from mm -hmm. their crack, 
from their, you know, their trauma, whatever. So I'm not sure it's really worth the, yeah. the chasing of it at this point. It, it's, yeah, it's, it, it can be a non-specific marker. The same way that, so like when I talked about white blood cell count, almost everyone who comes into the trauma bay has an elevated white blood cell count. And that resolves pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but that initial number would go, oh man, this person's got an infection. If you didn't take that into context, you know, and go, oh, this is a trauma patient and they've just been through this really stressful event. So, well, all my idea of the importance of trending and lab that mm -hmm. so obviously that's important, just like trending in anything, EKGs, EKGs, true vital signs. So, uh, you know, back 4,000 years ago, <laughs> We used to draw blood on a lot of pre-hospital patients and take it to the hospital. Mm -hmm. We had to carry several different types of vacutainers for different types of lab tests. And at some point, you know, that all went away, mostly because we'd come back with the next patient and the blood from the previous patient was still sitting on the little tray mm -hmm. by the last patient we brought in. So nobody ever did anything with it. And I think it was frustrated. But it seems to me like that could actually really improve patient care because if it was time stamped, then you could get a good trending before it was possible to get a sample in the hospital. Mm -hmm. right. I think the issue there is if you work at a place where you have one or two EMS agents that go to the same hospital, then you could probably standardize how to do it, how to label the blood so there's no errors. Mm -hmm. But when you have four or five hospitals in the area and numerous EMS agencies, trying to get all the hospitals on the same page is a problem. Yeah. The other problem would be if that blood does not get labeled appropriately and patient A's blood gets mixed up with patient B's and there's a weird value, it could impact care and cause a problem. So it would just have to be highly organized for it to work, but it makes sense. The problem is it has to be highly organized. When I worked in East Alabama, I worked with an ambulance service that was run by East Alabama Medical Center by that hospital. And it's really the only hospital in that region. Um, and so we only transported to two places. We would take people to Columbus to the trauma center over there, or we would take them to East Alabama. And 95% of our people went to East Alabama. And so we had all the tubes and we would take them, but we were the only ambulance service in the entire county. Um, and so it was just, we were just kind of an arm of the hospital. And so we did that and it worked fine. Um, but I, I'm with you, I've seen that not work as well. Um, I know there's a push to do that more now in some places um, for strokes because they're trying to get everything back. And so if you walk in the door with someone who has, you know, stroke symptoms and they're within four hours, they can go ahead and take that stuff to the lab and take the patient to the CT and have everything running at the same time. Um, but it just requires a lot of coordination between, you know, nursing management, EMS, and, you know, the stroke. There's just a lot of moving parts. So. Thank you. Cool. All right, here we go. That's what everyone wants to know about. UAB has a robust um, drug screen. Um, most places will only test for a handful of things. Um, and then ETOH is on there as well. All of our trauma patients that come in, we get a drug screen and alcohol on them. Um, this is, I would say, somewhat useful. It's useful if you have a person who's not acting right and you don't have a medical reason for why they're not acting right. And then they come back and it's like, oh, they're on meth. There we go. Like, that makes sense. Now I know why you're not acting right. And the same thing. You go, oh, man, this person's like really altered. Like, what's going on? Or like, oh, you've got seizures and, you know, now you're seizing again, but it's been well controlled. Oh, your blood alcohol is 250, you know. Like, I see you've been drinking. Um, and so it's helpful in that way. Um, they just added the cocaine metabolites and they added fentanyl. Um, so fentanyl is one of the things that we give a lot in the hospital. So it helps distinguish the things that we give someone versus what they found on the street and ate. Um, in doing research for this, I came across this little gem of a study. I don't know if y'all pay taxes, but I definitely do. And apparently at some point my tax dollars bought crack <laughs> that people got to smoke in some research facility so that they could measure their, their cocaine metabolites. Yeah. So look at this, and it's very, it's very like, look at this, on a secure research unit, six subjects smoked placebo, 10, 20, and 40 milligrams of cocaine with a precise dose delivery device, and six different subjects smoked 42 in a glass pipe. <laughs> I, don't, yeah, I don't know, I, um, I have no idea, but this couldn't have been cheap. It's a, when it said secure research unit, I was like, that's, that's that money. 
slide. Uh huh. Y'all ever seen every one of those positive? I don't think I've seen. Those. I haven't seen every one positive, but some of them do light up like Christmas. Yeah. 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 Some people will come in and you just go, I mean, this, you know, this guy. This so guy's is dead. that like a life goal to see how many of those you can uh, light up? I don't know. That should be one of the markers on the board. Um, you know, we have a, uh, we've got like a board with, you know, kind of extreme, you know, about lab values and things on it. So maybe that should be a thing we put on the board. Like if you get three or more, shouldn't you get like a set of steak knives or something? Yeah, it should be like a merit badge. It's like a bingo. One of the life, yeah, merit badge of life right there. Um, yeah, and then they'll, they'll come in pretty impressive, you know, uppers, downers. What's that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, just a couple of beers. Um, coags, coags. Um, all these. I feel like half of half of America is on blood thinners at this point. Um, for people who come in, and I have a suspicion that they're going to go to surgery, um, or that they are bleeding like into their head or somewhere else. I'm going to get coags on these people. Um, I had a, um, Kylie, this has all been in the last week. I had a guy with a subdural that had an artificial heart valve. So he was taking um, a blood thinner medicine and his INR, which is the measure of, of how thin it makes that part of his blood was way high, which obviously does not help his head bleed, right? And so wound up in this battle between cardiology and neurosurgery. Neurosurgery says, well, we need to reverse this because he's bleeding his head. And cardiology says it's not safe to reverse this because he has an artificial valve and you have to be this middleman. Um, so it's the equivalent of being on the wall at the hospital. <laughs> it's, that's my equivalent. Um, so um, these are things that if they come up elevated um, and we do have a suspicion that they're bleeding, we'll want to reverse. Um, it's also good to know they'll want this stuff before someone goes to surgery. So if we have someone that comes in and we think may need like emergent surgery, you know, they want to know this kind of stuff. And so I have a pretty low, uh, low threshold to order these tests on these people. All right, imaging. Um, again, this could be ours by itself. Uh, we're going to talk about basically the four kind of primary uh, modalities that we use in the ED. Um, before we get started on that, does anyone have any question about the labs portion of this? Any burning questions back there, Chief? Uh, we've actually had several comments about it. Uh, one person comments that it takes 15 minutes to set the TIG test. Uh, one person commented that cap accredited labs required for all blood testing. And then some answers there. Well, we already do blood glucose levels. So how does that work? And, uh, I think blood glucose is probably exempt from that because you can get that stuff at Walgreens. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Look at, yeah. yeah. Well, you can get you can get yeah. litmus paper at Walgreens too, so why don't we exempt pH? Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> you know, do you really want to do it? We can start doing your pregnancy test in the field if you want. Sure. Sure. Get those at Walgreens. <laughs> uh, so, right now in the streets, we don't have. Um, we don't really have any options for imaging. Um, I think that's going to change. I think in the next 10 years, ultrasound is going to be, you know, the thing. Um, I, I feel like every time I do one of these lectures, I say that and harp on ultrasound. I don't get paid by any ultrasound companies, but I just feel like that's the trend and that's where we're headed, okay? In the UK, yeah. Is there, are there places here using it pre-hospital? Is it Coleman? I know that Helen is looking to purchase so several places that are using ultrasound. We're buying them for the uh, initial training programs too, so like Jeff State, the Fire College, yeah. things like that. Yeah, it's, it's it's on the way. Yeah. All right, get ready, get ready, everyone. Um. So obviously, that's the first thing we'll talk about is ultrasound. Um. These are just a couple of different machines. We have actually both of those machines in the department. Um, this is, I've been told anywhere between 70 and $90,000. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> um, this is one of the point of care options. It's called the butterfly. Um, it can plug into an iPhone, iPad, Android device. 
Um, and it's, uh, I think this runs about $2,000 for the Pro plus a software subscription, which varies. Um, and you can get pretty decent images with that. I've used, uh, I think it's LBTs. I think she has one that I've used. Um, and then this is a different model of one of the big ultrasounds. Um, these things get really expensive. My wife is pregnant right now with twins and she really, really wanted to know if it was a boy and a girl or two boys or whatever. And so we paid some, you know, third party company like a hundred bucks or something for them to go in and put the ultrasound probe on her. And the machine that they used was like the Cadillac. I mean, it was super nice. Uh, but I mean, they can run six figures. Uh, these ultrasound machines can get pretty expensive. Um, the ones in the, uh, the OB section of the hospital have nice little gel warmers, so you don't get cold gel on you. Um, but we can do a lot with these things. Um, all of these probes that you see set up are designed to look from outside of the body, inside the body. But we also have transvaginal probes. If we think someone has an ectopic pregnancy or a pelvic abscess, um, we can actually use this transvaginal probe to look and see, get a better view of that. We also have transesophageal probes that cardiology will use. They'll put it in your throat and they take great pictures of the back of your heart. Um, and so uh, wherever we can stuff a probe into your body, uh, we can see some things. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, these are, so these are all gifts, which is why they're kind of choppy, um, but this is kind of the uh, this is kind of what you'll see this is all looking at a heart um, this is a slide that i used in the last lecture that i gave talking about um, cardiac tamponades so this is normal up here um, and things we can see we can see right atrium we can see a, the aortic outflow tract and we can see left atrium and left ventricle we can see the mitral valve flapping against the septal wall and we can see parts of the aortic valve right here. If I shift the probe a little bit, we can see all of the aortic valve. Um, use the pin and circle it. Okay. So this is the right atrium aorta. This is the left atrium, left ventricle. Sorry, I can't spell. Um, this is the mitral valve. That's the atrium. Atrium. Because those three should be the same size. What's that? <laughs> um, yeah, Does that, did that show up on the internet? Yes. People of the internet can see? Good deal. Um, and the, the purpose of, of me doing this slide was to say that this is normal. Normal. Um, and in this slide, we can see the same things. So we see right atrium, aorta, left atrium. And then we see this. And we see a little bit here. And that's a pericardial effusion. And it's pretty quick to see. Um, and this image down here, there's a cheat right there. It says it's got collapse and that's that kind of wavy portion right here. Um, this is actually a cardiac tamponade. So you see a fusion that goes all the way around, but then we see collapse, um, up here of the right side of the heart. So, um, cool. I've marked that up pretty good. Good. Um, so next up, x-ray. Uh, the dentist has the little portable x-ray guns. They, they're good at taking pictures of teeth. Um, and then we demoed, were you at conference uh, a couple of months ago where they demoed a very small, yes, a very small x-ray machine that was kind of cool. I, I don't think it's good for anything other than extremities. Um, I don't think you could fit some of our patients' extremities in this very small x-ray machine. Um, but it was pretty cool. It did give you real-time images of the bones, kind of like in the children's books when they walk they walk in front of you with the, the, the x-ray screen, um, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so maybe there's utility, maybe there's a function for that, you know, becoming more mobile in the future. As it stands now, this is kind of the most mobile 
we have a radiology department where we can just put you in a bed and wheel you to a place and they can stand you up and you know manipulate an x-ray machine on an arm um, or we can drive this to your bedside and you know move the arm and take pictures that way this requires um, i'm actually not sure how much these machines are Do you have any idea how much these are they're probably not cheap um, and it requires a dedicated person so you have to have someone who goes to school for two years to get a degree to go in and shoot these pictures and do it the right way um, there's also radiation associated with this it's not a tremendous amount it's not as much as you would get like by doing a ct but an ultrasound is zero radiation you know what i mean um, things that we're really good at seeing with x-ray bones and lung um, so this is an actual picture that i screen grabbed this is a 40 year old guy and I'd be willing to bet that if this is the first x-ray any of you ever saw, would you say this is normal or not normal? Not normal, right? Because you only really see one lung here. And that's not normal. We're supposed to have two. Um, so this right here is where a lung should be and it's not. Um, that's pretty much all I can get out of this is I go, well, there's fluid there there's something there that's not supposed to be there and that's pretty much where it stops um when we read x-rays in the hospitals uh, the way it was taught to us is the a b c d e so a is airway and we look I'll step back here and see if i can see carina looks like it probably branches right there and then stops um so that's a b is bones so we'll look at all the bones and see if there's any fractures or anything um, the c is the cardiac silhouette that you can't see at all here but we look at the heart here um, it should be about a third of the distance of the of the entire chest wall um, the d is the diaphragm these lungs in a healthy person should come down and make a nice point <clears throat> and then we should have a nice diaphragm wall on either side if we can't see that point like we can't over here there's a problem there's an effusion or some kind of fluid there that's blocking that these are the low points down by the back and that's where the fluid would collect if they're standing up or laying down um, and then e is everything else and that's when we look for the pneumothoraces um, you know we look for pneumonias and things like that actually in the lung tissue itself and so that's kind of how we systematically go through these x-rays um, so i actually have a ct of this guy in a second that we'll follow up on um, so that you can see the difference. So x-ray is pretty cheap. You can walk into any urgent care and they can x-ray whatever you want. Um, but this is kind of all they're limited to seeing. You can see lung and you can see bone pretty well, but you can't really see any muscle. You can't see fat. You can't really distinguish what kind of fluid this is, if it's blood or an effusion or what. All right, questions about x-ray? Cool. Brings us to CT um so whereas an x-ray you had to have a dedicated person to use and you had a big machine that they had to push around this takes up an entire room um and i was just curious um you can buy one of these on ebay turns out used they're about two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but you can go get a refurb is it like lightly used or? i don't know how heavily it was used um yeah <laughs> um this takes up an entire room in the hospital and this takes an entire team of people to really know how to use there's a lot of complicated software that i don't know what they're doing when i go in there i stand there and i feel like an idiot because they're working away and i'm just like i'm completely out of my league with what y'all are doing on this machine um the patient goes in and there is actually an x-ray probe this is a spiral ct that moves around in a circle and it takes x-rays like that in a circle and then it uses software to put all those images together and so you get this kind of image on a screen cool um they've done trials before where they put ct machines on ambulances to see if it would improve um, stroke mortality um, this is actually ucla um, I couldn't find anything about the follow-up to see if this actually worked or didn't work, but there was a German company that developed a small CT scanner that fit in the back of one of these one of these trucks, um, and they would be dispatched 
only two strokes and that's it um, this truck when they initially did the study was staffed by a neurologist um, a medic a nurse um, a ct tech and like one other person i can't remember who now in that truck they're all packed in there um i think they ran something like 93 calls the first year um so pretty resource intense um, um it was nice because they actually had it was a lab tech because they had a small lab on the truck that they could run labs with and they actually had uh things like tpa and, and you know clock busters that they could give in the vehicle um the last thing that i could find about this was they had expanded it i think they had bought three of these things that they're running around in southern california with so um cts have radioactive material in them so i can't imagine this would be a great vehicle to have a wreck in um, i don't know if have any of y'all done like the hazrad trainer stuff out in vegas and they've shown you the video of the uh Yes, and it's I think it's in Russia or some Eastern European country where they, they have like an eight second, like they have an air horn. So like a guy will run in with a screwdriver and like do one turn and then run away. I I just think there's probably some measure of hazard to having a you know radioactive material riding around. Um, but then there's nuclear waste that comes up around 459 every day too, so it's fine. Um, so these are the kinds of images that you get with the CT. Um, they are, if if X-ray is black and white TV, this is color TV, okay? Um, it's nice because you can open up two windows and you can have the body cut this way and you can have the body cut this way. And I can put the images up side by side. And if you see this line right here, as I scroll up and down in this image, this line will move up and down and tell me where I am and gives me a good sense of kind of what I'm looking at. And as you can see, the entire left lung here in this person is completely whited out. You can see that on both sides. And then there's also an effusion, like a little layering effusion here um, in the right lung as well. Um, this is a guy that uh, I think it was like a 40 year old guy with uh, metastatic lung cancer. Um, but you can see uh, the, the uh, bronchi where the carina splits right here. Um, and then it just stops. So um, they can also measure Hounsfield units on here. If you can see that this has a little bit different color to it than this material here. They can measure that stuff and see if it's blood or an exudate or transudate, stuff like that. So you get a little bit more information out of it. Um, X-rays are relatively cheap. CTs are relatively expensive. Um, I uh, concussed myself on my mountain bike and wound up with a CT of my head. It cost about 10 grand. Um, that fortunately insurance picked up, but uh, they're not cheap, not cheap. Um, so if CT is color TV, this is like high def. So these are MRIs. Um, they don't use radiation, um, but they're very expensive. They're more expensive than a CT, um, and they take a long time to do. That CT, we can get someone in and out of that CT. <clears throat> the actual scan itself um, will take a matter of seconds. We can do a head scan in 30 seconds or something. Um, we can do that stuff really quickly. MRI takes a while. You're looking at 30, 45 minutes to do a head, um, the same thing with a knee. But what you get with this is high def images of the ligaments. So I can see spinal cord really, really well with this. I can see all the ligaments inside your knee. And so the orthopedists, when you injure yourself, really like these pictures because they can tell where you know the tear is in your shoulder or which ligament specifically is injured in your knee. Um, we use these a lot in neurosurgery when we try and decide if there is um, injury to the spinal cord or any of the large nerves, uh, because it takes good pictures of that. Um, the CT machine is just shaped like a donut and you kind of go in and out of the middle of the donut. This is more like a paper towel tube and you go into the paper towel tube. This is not good for claustrophobic people. Um, and so 
it's not uncommon for us to have to give, you know, a little touch of benzos for people going up. You know, it's not uncommon for us to get phone calls that say, hey, that patient you sent up here, they're freaking out right now. Um, you get great images with this. It's expensive. You can see that that's a much more clear image of the head than what we looked at before. And you can see really clearly the spinal cord as it comes down right here. Um, and so neurosurgery likes this a good bit. Uh, the problem is it takes some time to get. Um, they're really expensive. Um, and you can't use it if you have any metal in your body. Um, these are these are actual pictures, not from our hospital. Um, but um, yeah, if you have any any magnetic material near one of these machines, they pull at something like 200 times the strength of like a refrigerator magnet. Um, there was actually a six year old kid that got killed up in New York because an oxygen bottle flew across the room and hit him in the head. Um, so uh, that's a hospital bed. That's an instrument cart. Um, these things get lubricated by liquid hydrogen. And if this happens, they have to drain the whole thing, which is not cheap to do. Um, so these machines cost in the millions of dollars. I did not look at eBay to see if you could buy them used. Um, so uh, these are things that we try to not do in the ED. We try not to get MRIs because they take so long to do. People just sit down there and languish. So, um, but anyway, those are the things that we look for. That's what I got. Questions about labs or imaging? I know a ton of that stuff. That, all that stuff is just next step. You know, when you have a patient and you say, hey, we need to go to the hospital, they may need to get a CT, like at least you have some idea of what the heck is going on at this point. You know what I mean? Questions, questions from the internet. Yep, so we had a bunch of uh, kind of chatter still about lab stuff. I don't think anybody's real enthused about trying to carry around a CT scanner, <laughs> a ray machine or an MRI with an ambulance um, based on the text messages I'm getting. But we we do um, we do actually have some questions before we wrap up from the first segment and um, from Dr. Ferguson's lecture. So he walked out of the room for just a minute, so that's perfect timing. Uh, <laughs> we can answer his questions for him, and then he has no basis for that's that okay. section. So the question is pretty interesting. So uh, TXA and trauma patients, oftentimes we get trauma patients who have been in a wreck, and they may tell us. I was having chest pain or I think I blacked out. Mm -hmm. There's evidence of, of heart attack or stroke prior to the trauma. Mm -hmm. So um, what is TXA, um, you know, absolutely contraindicated. Uh, <laughs> and so my kind of my answer to that would be it's, it's uh, you know, risk analysis, cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. And uh, if They've been in a wreck. They're not going to get thrombolytics anyway if they're having a heart attack or a stroke. Correct. And if we think they're going to bleed to death, then we should probably give them TXA if there's evidence of that. And it's not really going to hurt anything. And the TXA is reversible. Is that correct? Yes, you could give. Uh, yes. Short answer. So all those are pieces of information that I think could help us make that um, make that decision in the field. Unfortunately, it occurs to me that when it's really important, we probably won't know because the patient won't be able to communicate with us. It's okay while you're out, Doc. We were answering the questions on good half. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, the, the, way the, the, TXA TXA protocol, the way the TXA protocol is written in the book currently, um, it's really strange. If you look at the contraindications for it, there's something about like the patient has a history of red green color blindness. It's like, so, and that basically comes from a small study that showed that if you gave it over time, there was an increased risk of like retinal damage. These were people that were on TXA drips for months at a time. So this, the, those, that does not apply to the patients that we're giving TXA to at all. Okay. Um, that's so one of the, we should, we should probably remove that contraindication. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. That, my recommendation, and again, this is one of these get involved things, right? So, um, yeah, I think that that's one of the things that needs to be revisited. Um, they're, they're, you're not going to do a lot of damage given someone TXA. Um, it's a pretty safe drug, you know. And the flip side of that would be 
don't run out and give TXA if there's no evidence of hemorrhagic shock. Yeah. Or, yeah, you've got to have a reason to give yeah, it. You know? Yeah, nobody can give something. There's not a need for it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, the last week I gave TXA to a upper GI bleed and a head bleed. You know, yeah. um, gave it last night to a head bleed in the trauma bay. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. yeah. There was a question about TXA and heart attack and car wrecks. Did I discuss that already? That's what we're yeah, talking about. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. I'll be quiet. <laughs> no, they all want your input because none of the rest of our opinions matter. Well, it doesn't matter either. So. <laughs> <laughs> I can show you emails to prove that. So. Hey, thanks, Dr. Eversole. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Person. Great lectures as always. If you're uh, with us online and you haven't already done so, please fill out an attendance form. There's a link in the chat box. If you're watching on a phone or you can't get to the chat box, then please send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. That will produce an automated reply with a link to the attendance form. Even if you don't need the CEUs, please fill out an attendance form. That's the way we can track attendance. It's also the way that we can uh, get your feedback. So thanks everybody for being here. MDAC at one o'clock, Gardendale Civic Center, if you're in the area. Yep. Have, I'm sorry? For the for the tennis form, the password is TBI, right? Oh yes, thank you. TBI is the password for the tennis form today. July the 28th will be at Troy University in Hawkins Hall, uh, sponsored by Troy Fire Department, and we will have an afternoon skills lab included then. So hope to see you there if you're in the area. Come on by. Thanks everybody. We're gonna sound off. Thank you.